So in the lab, you are going to be learning the hands-on techniques of soft tissue mobilization. Um, but we are going to talk a little bit about the theory behind soft tissue mobilization and the specific connective tissues involved. So the learning um, objectives for this section are, I want you to be able to discuss how the inflammatory response impacts soft tissue mobilization. There's a little separate lecture where we specifically talk about the stages of inflammation and what role soft tissue mobilization plays in that. Um, I want you to know the, the role of ground substance in connective tissue and how immobility affects ground substance. Um, describe three different types of connective tissue in terms of collagen alignment, ground substance, vascularity, and healing time, and to be able to give two examples in the body of each. Um, describe and apply the stress strain curve to use of soft tissue mobilization. I will we'll talk about that. Um, and indications and contraindications and precautions for soft tissue mobilization. Um, how is it helpful and when is it not advised? So pretty straightforward. And we will also talk about how you document soft tissue mobilization and we will do some documentation practice in the lab. So um, soft tissue mobilization is a manual technique that involves specific movement of the connective and muscle tissues throughout the body. So we apply biomechanical forces um, to tissues at various speeds, depths, and directions. Um, the directional movements that we do, they can be parallel to the muscle fibers or connective tissue fibers. They can be perpendicular, they can be oblique. We can bend the fibers um, or we can use localized direct pressure on the fibers. So soft tissue mobilization alone is not going to restore function, but integrating it into the practice of physical therapy um, allows us to address and identify some soft tissue dysfunctions. So um, the soft tissue mobilization is one aspect of the treatment. Um, the clinician's also going to do structural and functional assessment of the patient to figure out what stage of tissue healing they're in and select the appropriate soft tissue technique and other appropriate treatments. So using um, soft tissue mobilization to assess the tissues, um, we're going to um, try to identify soft tissue dysfunction, um, identify soft tissue dysfunction that might be causing myofascial pain. And um, we want to find um, altered structure and function such as postural and mechanical strains. So we'll talk a little bit about the individual um, types of tissue strains and the types of connective tissue. So the functional joint concept is, we talked about a little bit in kinesiology, um, specifically with regard to the scapular thoracic joint, how the scapula moves on the thorax. It's not two uh, bone ends coming together, but it's a functional joint that um, allows adjoining structures to move in relationship to each other. So that's not the only one in the body, the scapula thoracic joint, there are lots of other ones. And the spaces in our body are maintained by fascia. So if you took everything in our body out except fascia, you'd have something shaped like you that was made out of connective tissue. So the fascia takes up space in the body. We don't have any empty spaces. <laughs> um, there, something has to take up that space. And um, it's usually um, fascia, connective tissue. So connective tissue is made up of ground substance and um, collagen fibers and a few other fibers, which we'll briefly talk about. So tendons, ligaments, and joint capsules, and the fascia and the skin are all forms of connective tissue. Um, we're primarily in musculoskeletal disorders, um, are, we're interested in disorders to connective tissue and muscle tissue and their interrelationship. So um, you can think of connective tissue as connective tissue proper, which is the stuff that's filling all the spaces, um, and specialized connective tissue. So um, specialized, the connective tissue proper is broken down into loose and dense connective tissue, and um, loose and dense connective tissue is classified by the arrangement of fibers, whether it's regular or irregular, and the density of the fibers, how close are they to each other, and how much ground substance is there. 
So each form of connective tissue has similar components, but the proportions vary according to the function of the tissue. So when we're talking about ground substance, we mean the extracellular material, which is mainly proteoglycans, which is a fluid or gel consistency, depending on the connective tissue type. Um, there are other elements of connective tissue suspended in the ground substance. Um, the ground substance serves as a route for transport of nutrients and um, byproducts of cellular uh, metabolism, the waste products. Um, and in between the um, suspended cells and the circulatory system is the um, ground substance. So in a tendon, for example, which is pretty dense, Fibroblasts, which are the cells making collagen, make up about 20% of the volume. The fibers, so the collagen fibers and elastin fibers, and the ground substance make up 80% of the volume. 70% of that 80% is water. So we have a lot of water in our connective tissues. Ideally, if we're dehydrated, our connective tissues are not going to be able to absorb as much force and transmit as much force because um, they're going to be more brittle. And um, that is an issue in injury. So dense regular connective tissue includes tendons and ligaments. Um, the fibers are compact and regularly arranged in parallel sheets or bundles. And um, there's a dense, a, a dense um, pack of collagen fibers, basically. And there's a relatively small amount of ground, ground substance, so that results in minimal tissue extensibility. And we want that for tendons and ligaments because ligaments have to hold joints, um, you know, they provide stability for joints and tendons have to transmit motion from muscles to bones. So um, we need that minimal extensibility. We need a nice strong bundle of collagen, basically. They have limited vascularity and that in, um, leads to increased healing time following trauma. Um, in trauma or surgery where tendons are um, damaged or cut um, and then they're sutured, they heal slowly. And you really shouldn't stretch them for at least a month after suturing. So um, we have to avoid them uh, contracting, but we don't want to stretch them either. So um, the healing of tendons and ligaments is of a lot of importance in um, rehabilitation. So Basically, the fibers are straight, they're tightly packed and parallel to each other. So these are um, tendons and ligaments, structures requiring high strength in one direction. Dense irregular connective tissue features fibers which don't run in a coherent direction. So the um, types of tissues that are made up of dense irregular connective tissue include joint capsules, aponeuroses, the periosteum, the dermis of the skin, and fascial sheaths. Um, the connective tissue is arranged in a dense but multi-directional fashion. So that's that's what you see, those pink waves running through the, the middle of the section. Um, so forces are resisted in a multi-directional, three-dimensional um, way. Um, dense, irregular connective tissue has slightly greater concentration of ground substance and slightly improved vascularity over dense, regular connective tissue. So it's a little more flexible uh, and it moves in multi-directional, three-dimensional way in, instead of that one-directional the way a tendon or ligament might do. So loose connective tissue or loose, irregular connective tissue, it's also called, it's found just about everywhere in the body. Um, and so the superficial and deep fascial layers, nerve and muscle sheaths, the endomycium holding together the individual bundles of muscle fibers, um, loose connective tissue is a sparse, um, multi-directional framework of collagen and elastin that's the primary arrangement of um, fibers, there is a lot of ground substance and a lot of vascularity um, as compared to dense connective tissues, which have a lot less vascularity. So the loose connective tissue um, provides support for structures such as blood vessels, lymph vessels, and nerves. It also binds together other tissues. So uh, most of our organ systems have a, um, an organ capsule that's made up of loose connective tissue. 
So basically, if there's free space in the body, it's filled with loose connective tissue. We don't really have free space in our body. So the structure of connective tissue varies, but there are similar building blocks between the different types. Um, and all of the types of connective tissue function to provide stability and mobility. Um, the specific proportions of the elements um, determine the functional capacity of the connective tissue. So the three fiber types that are seen in connective tissue are collagen, elastin, and reticulin. Collagen is by far the most abundant and um, the orientation of the collagen fibers has a really big effect on the function of the connective tissue. Um, the, um, there are four different types of collagen, but type one collagen is probably the one most involved with mechanical disorders, and that's found in loose and dense connective tissue. Um, types two through four collagen are found in hyaline cartilage, arterial linings, the basement membranes of um, tissues. Um, elastin and reticulum fibers are a smaller proportion compared to the collagen but they do contribute to the elasticity of the connective tissue. So all of those fibers are um, secreted by the fibroblasts, which are embedded in the ground substance. So um, in this little photograph of um, loose connective tissue, you see those little blobs and those are the um, fibroblasts which are shooting out the collagen. So, Tropocollagen is the basic fiber of collagen. It's shaped like a wave, it's crimped. Um, the crimp is the main feature behind the um, viscoelasticity of connective tissue. You can stretch it, it stretches back, it's nice. Um, the crimp is different for each type of connective tissue. In the tendon, um, the tissue can withstand a lot of stress, um, so the Fibers are staggered and overlapping. Um, so each uh, tropocollagen molecule is overlapped with the next one in the line, and that gives it more strength. Um, I always think of spinning wool, <laughs> you know, wool fibers, when I think of collagen fibers, because it's the same thing. If you want a stronger, denser yarn, you have to have more overlap in the fibers. I know not everybody thinks of things in terms of yarn, but that's where my brain goes. So um, there's normal cross-linking between the tropocollagen molecules um, to strengthen the structure and to resist tensile stre um, stress. Um, in, in the denser connective tissues like tendons and ligaments, there is a very small amount of crimp, so they just don't stretch as much as the other tissues. So um, we'll talk about the stress strain curve in a couple minutes, but any changes in connective tissue, there are lots of different things that can cause changes in connective tissue. Interstitial swelling, um, so excess fluid in the interstitial space, um, or otherwise known as edema. Uh, excessive scar tissue immobility. Compression on surrounding tissues can cause changes in connective tissue and um, restrict normal movement. So a really good example of um, change that happened in connective tissue is in carpal tunnel syndrome which um, this, rep this uh, graphic represents. So um, you can get medium nerve, median nerve entrapment because of um, edema from compression from other tissues and um, the inflamed tendons, those um, eight tendons that go through the uh, finger flexor tendons um, can also pinch the median nerve and that causes the symptoms that are um, result in uh, carpal tunnel syndrome. So if there's excessive scar tissue, sometimes fibroblasts just go crazy um, to form new connective tissue to reunite a wound and excessive fibroblastic activity leads to excessive scar tissue. So um, you, you need to move the tissue in order to remodel it and maintain the extensibility of that scar tissue. So scar tissue is um, sort of patching the holes but it also needs to stay flexible. So um, doing appropriate exercise and causing appropriate remodeling, um, can you can get a nice functional scar. If you have, um, if you don't have appropriate movement, then you can get that excessive scar tissue. And abnormal biomechanical strains can also contribute to chronic inflammation, which can compromise neurovascular and lymphatic structures. 
So in the um, photos below, there's a, an ulnar nerve entrapment from excessive scar tissue. Um, the picture on the left is the before, and the picture on the right is after um, they removed the excess connective tissue to free that ulnar nerve. So um, it's uh, excessive scar tissue, just like everything in the body, you have to have enough, but not too much. So if the fibroblasts get crazy and make too much scar tissue and you don't have appropriate remodeling, then you can cause entrapment of other structures. So if you're immobile, it causes ground substance dehydration. So I talked about that a little bit earlier, but um, when the ground substance becomes dehydrated, I said, think shrink wrap because it sort of shrinks and it causes tissue rigidity and stiffness. And now it requires more force to elongate or compress tissues. So restrictive cross-linking, um, which is um, discussed in the um, soft tissue mobilization chapter that is linked in the Canvas module, um, it can be caused by dehydration, um, which causes decreased spaces between the fibers, bringing them closer together. The proximity of the fibers causes increased formation of restricted cross-linking fibers. So cross-linking is normal and it provides some stability and structural integrity to connective tissue, but it's the restrictive cross-links that are detrimental. And that is a lot of times what we are specifically trying to affect with soft tissue mobilization. So here's the stress strain curve. So stress is the force applied. So that's a stretching force or a bending force. Um, or a um, trans fiber force. And strain is the change in the length of the tissue. So we apply, let's just say we apply a stretching force and we change the length of the tissue a certain percent. Um, when we stretch collagen tissues, remember how I said how the tropocollagen fibers are overlap? When we stretch them, basically the first thing in the stretch, we're gonna take the crimp out of the tropocollagen. So you stretch it and it kind of stretches back like a rubber band. You stretch the rubber band and the elasticity brings it back. That's the elastic phase of the stress strain curve. Um, so if you're stretching in the elastic phase, you're not really gonna create any more length in the fibers. Um, once you get past the elastic phase, and usually this happens with a longer hold on the stretch, the fibers start to glide across each other. And now we're creating more length um, and that is considered the plastic phase. So think of plastic as changeable. Um, so that we're now we're changing the length of the fibers. Um, there's a certain amount of stress that the fibers can take and um, you have to get past the elastic phase to change the fibers. If you get beyond that, you can actually um, fracture the fibers or you know pull them apart. We're not gonna do that manually <laughs> with our hands, but you can imagine that trauma could get you past that into that um, fracture part of the stress strain curve. So the whole idea is the elastic phase is where you're just taking the crimp out of the tropocollagen and then it goes back um, like a spring sort of. And the plastic phase, those fibers are actually gliding over each other and you're creating new length in the tendon or whatever tissue you're, stre you're stretching. So the idea is the stress is the force applied, the strain is the change in tissue length. So by applying force, we're trying to affect change in tissue length, basically, <laughs> if you wanna think of it that way. So the changes that we can influence in connective tissue using soft tissue mobilization, we can help to decrease scar tissue by stimulating appropriate remodeling. Um, it can cause improved lubrication and hydration of the ground substance, um, the breaking of restrictive crosslinks, the lengthening of tissues by stretching into that plastic phase, um, decreased fluid stasis because we're moving fluid out of the area, and decreased pain as a result of a lot of those different things. So soft tissue mobilization can have um, a nice effect. It's not gonna completely um, resolve the issue, but it's gonna contribute to the healing process. So you can have changes in your skin due to injury. And we're gonna do some skin assessment in the lab when we do soft tissue mobilization. 
but the skin can lose some mobility due to scarring and um, that immobility can cause further decrease in functional movement. So soft tissue mobilization can help improve biomechanical function. Um, it can help improve vascular and lymph circulation, and it can help um, improve the uh, muscle tone or decrease muscle tone and pain. So um, those are all good changes. We like those. So we can affect those with soft tissue mobilization. So um, there, there are gonna be a lot of changes in skeletal muscle for lots of different reasons. So one of the reasons that we have changes in skeletal muscle is myofascial dysfunction. So restricted scar tissue, restricted muscle play, restricted connective tissue extensibility. Um, you could have um, weakness in skeletal muscle or muscle tone from guarding. If you're um, in pain, that can stimulate your muscles to contract to guard the area. Um, you can have altered muscle recruitment patterns um, or changes in normal patterns due to restricted joints, muscles, and fascia. It's where you're doing compensatory movements. So trigger points are hyper irritable points in the skeletal muscle or fascia, and they're usually painful upon compression and they often cause referred pain to a specific um, path. And um, trigger points can be influenced by trauma, scarring, disease, stress, or postural dysfunction. So we can use um, soft tissue mobilization to change myofascial dysfunction. Um, we can use it to change trigger points. Um, soft tissue, tissue dysfunction due to neuromuscular control can cause poor posture and poor movement patterns. Poor neuromuscular control can result from um, changes in normal alignment and movement. So it's like you have a knee injury, but your shoulder starts to hurt because you're walking funny and you're hiking your shoulder up. So poor posture and those altered movement patterns can really um, change normal alignment and movement and um, end up causing other problems in skeletal muscle. So um, we can influence those changes um, with soft tissue mobilization. We can, um, Changes due to soft tissue mobilization can improve posture and elicit improved muscle recruitment. Um, it can improve stabilization and neuromuscular control. It can change muscle tone by decreasing muscle tone. Um, we can also um, change the muscle play accessory mobility um, of functional joints. So we're gonna move the um, soft tissues a little bit to get better muscle play. Um, we can improve um, functional excursion of the muscles and decrease pain using soft tissue mobilization. So um, the, the types of indications that we're trying to address with soft tissue mobilization, soft tissue congestion. So that could be fluid stasis or it could be dehydration, but there's just congestion in the soft tissue. Um, adaptive shortening where a muscle is not getting used and so it adapts by shortening. Um, we can, um, it, sometimes we want to increase afferent stimulation to close the gate for pain management. That's a good indication for STM. Um, so we're stimulating um, sensory fibers to um, have an inhibitory effect on those pain fibers. Um, STM can address scarring, superficial or deep. And um, it can also address soft tissue industry, um, injury, muscle, tendon, fascia, and ligament. So um, muscle tissue, um, you can have muscle strains. So a mild strain is like overstretching of the muscle or tendon with less than 5% disruption is what they call it. A moderate strain is a partial tear of any of those tissues and a severe strain can involve a complete rupture of tendon or muscle. So you're probably gonna have more effect um, with a mild to moderate strain than you are gonna have with a severe strain. That might involve something that is less conservative than soft tissue mobilization. So um, the lots of indications, lots of reasons why we might want to do soft tissue mobilization. When it comes to contraindications, of course, malignancy, that's a contraindication for almost anything. We don't want to do anything where we might break up um, tumor cells and send them out throughout the body. That's not good. Um, if there's a hypermobile joint segment, we don't want to make it more mobile. So we're going to work on stabilization rather than um, mobilization on that. 
Inflammatory skin conditions. Again, we don't want to uh, move inflammation into other areas of the body. Um, or if you have an inflammatory skin condition that's caused by infection, we don't want to um, spread that either. Fractures, um, obviously we want to immobilize for a while rather than mobilizing um, until we get to a further stage of healing. Hemorrhage sites, sometimes if you have um, excessive blood under the area, it can be a precaution for um, soft tissue mobilization. Um, and depending on the extent, uh, the extent of the hemorrhage, it can be a contraindication. Um, if it's actively bleeding, well, that's a big contraindication. Um, obstructive edema. So if you have um, obstructive edema because your lymph system is not normal, um, soft tissue mobilization is not gonna move edema out of the area because um, the lymph system is not cooperating. So um, at that point, we have to take, we have to use other strategies. Um, acute rheumatological conditions. So um, sometimes people who have um, rheumatoid arthritis, for example, um, cannot tolerate soft tissue mobilization because it increases um, inflammation in their joints. Um, localized infection, because we don't want to turn a localized infection into a systemic infection. So general contraindications might not prohibit the use of soft tissue mobilization um, in other soft tissue sites. So let's say you have one hypermobile joint segment, that doesn't mean you're not gonna do it in another area of the body, um, or you have a fracture or a hemorrhage or something, you might still be able to do it in other, other soft tissue sites.